welcome. My name is Dr. Faye Allard, and this is The Little Big Things. So you might think that you're here today for a lecture. Mm -mm 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 -mm. <laughs> now you're not. All my students know is that I never give just a regular lecture. Today, in fact, is an invitation. It's an invitation to join with me and try and put some good into the world. Who's up for a bit of that? You know you are. So that means that you'll actually have to do some stuff today. So if you bought a newspaper and you thought you'd be reading the newspaper today, you're going to be doing some stuff. It means you're going to have to participate a little bit. We're going to do some experiments. Oh, yes, we are. And there's going to be not one, not two, not three, but four major surprises today. So hold on to your knickers, as we say in England, <laughs> because we're about to go on a ride. I have a question for you. We're going to start today with you. So today's lecture is all about, it's supposed to be about teaching. So I thought I'd start with a question. So you're going to use Nearpod if you're logged in to do this. My question is this. What is the name of your favorite teacher? So type that in. That will come up on the screen now. OK, so let's get those names up there. And let's see if I can scroll through this. And you can scroll through it too. I think I can do this by doing that. Oh, look at all these names. We've got uh, Harold Cox. We've got uh, John Joyce there. We've got Nuenna. Uh, Kelly McGrogan, we've got uh, Dr. Shakespeare, we've got Mary Hoffel, we've got Derek Perkins, Dorothy McBride. Look at that, all these amazing teachers there, Liz Canapari. So, now we've got all these names up, I want you to take a quick second to think about this. Every single one of those names made an impact on a person in this room, didn't they? Every single one. And you probably had loads of teachers, loads of them. But these are the ones, these are the ones that left the mark on you. So much so that you would publicly show your love for them on this board here. But I want to know a bit more. It's not enough to know their names. I want to know why. So I'm coming down to you. So if we can have our mic ready. I want to hear from you. So someone in the front here, if you could tell me what is the name of your favorite teacher and why? So someone, raise your hands if you'd like to share who was your favorite teacher and why. OK, Miss Dee Dee. Uh, now, that's not supposed to work like that. <laughs> My favorite professor is Professor Ehlert, because from day one, she's there. You know, whether even while she's home doing things and I'm stuck on the computer because I'm illiterate when it comes to computer things, I'll text her, and she always answers and helps me. No. Uh, well, that backfired. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be about me. So let's find someone who's not going to talk about me. Thank you, Miss Dee. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else want to tell me the name of your teacher? Let's come over here. Yo. Um, Miss Amy Lewis. Amy Lewis. So tell me yeah. what's so special about Amy Lewis. She's just like real cool. She like respect us, you know I'm saying. She treat me right and she a very understanding teacher. She helped me out when I needed to be helped. She always there for me. Oh. So what a legend Amy Lewis is, huh? Thank yes. you. Yeah, Amy Lewis. All right. From the stories that we heard, my suspicion is is that it's not so much about what you learn, is it? It's about how that person made you feel. And the names that are on the board, I'm willing to bet 100 bucks that all of these names left, someone, left you with something important, made you feel some kind of way. And I think that's where we're going today, yeah? Trying to work out what those things are. But this actually brings me to my first surprise, because there are three people in this audience that have no idea they're about to be on the big screen. Because they're watching live from England, and they are my three favorite teachers. So can we get up my three favorite teachers, please? Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Hello, Mr. McKenzie. Hello, Miss Milligan. Can you hear me? Oh, hello. Hello. 
Uh, Mr. McKenzie, do you have your audio on? Yes. Oh, hello. So, Mr. McKenzie, would you like to tell the audience about uh, your role at my high school and perhaps your relationship to me? Well, you, you were in my form for five years. I was your form tutor, and you were an exceptional being in every sense because you held everything together in the class, and I didn't realise your sort of formative role until you, we had that amazing reunion all those years ago, which you organised like you're doing with this particular thing, and I didn't realise the gifts you inherited because they're so obvious to me, you know, in just watching you do what I did for you know, three and a half decades. So, well done, Faye. And this is not about me, it's about you. Well, it was supposed to be about you and you've just ruined things, haven't you? <laughs> right. This is supposed to be about you. So let me, let me go into why you are my favorite teacher. I'm always be my favorite teacher. And I've already cried already, so everyone ready? Because I'm probably gonna cry now. All right, so Mr. McKenzie, um, there are two things why you are an incredible teacher. Number one, I remember when I was about 16 and in England, that's when you finish high school. And I had no idea about what I wanted to do or how I was going to do it. No idea whatsoever. And I was going to take a route that took me down a vocational route and where I learned a skill. I thought maybe I could do design or something like that. And you sat me down after class one day and you said, you are not going to do that. You are going to go and do your A-levels, which is the academic route. And you sat me down for 10 minutes. You gave me 10 minutes of your life. And you, you changed my life. Uh, uh, I told you to bring the tissues, didn't I? Uh, so, Mr. McKenzie, you changed my life with that, that little talk that you did that I bet you thought didn't mean anything at all. That, that meant a lot to me, and I swear I wouldn't be on this stage right now doing this talk if it wasn't for you having that, that conversation with me. So thank you, and thank you to all the teachers that were on that board that made that difference, yeah? Because they really make a difference. So Mr. McKenzie, in the interest of time, <laughs> I'm gonna love you and leave you right now, but I want you, <laughs> but I'll be back in England soon and I'll come and say hi, and then you can give me a detention for tricking you into doing this. Thanks uh, so much. I want to give a round of applause to my teacher and all the amazing teachers out there. Thank you, Mr. McKenzie. See ya. Okay. So, now I've got to pull myself together. This brings me to my hypothesis of my talk, if I can do this, which is, actually, these little things matter a lot, don't they? They really, really matter that my life would be different if it wasn't for that one talk with Mr. McKenzie after school one day where he said he believed in me and he said that I could do it, my life would be different. So I think we tend to underestimate just how important these things are, that they're much more important than anything that we can measure. So sorry to do this, but assessment. Oh, thank you. <laughs> assessment. Assessment, we can't assess these things, yeah? They're not measurable, but they're real. So if we think about what we mean by a little big thing, it's those small words of encouragement. It's those, you can do it. It's kindness. It's compassion. It's empathy. It's all that good stuff, isn't it? And that stuff matters. And we don't seem to know that, or at least... We don't seem to value that. So let's get you guessing. I'm going to put a figure on the board here. And I want to see if anyone can guess what this percentage represents. So you can just yell out your answers. What do you think 27% stands for? What do you think 20% of what? 27% of what? Anyone got any ideas? You're like my class on Monday morning right now. <laughs> Okay, we had a guess. 27% of people become teachers. Very good guess, but no. But thank you for guessing. Anyone else want to have a guess? 
Twenty percent of people. Kinds. And that's a good guess too. All right. Are you ready to be smacked round the face with a wet fish? <laughs> because this is actually the percentage of students that agree that their their professors care about them. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> this is bad, yeah. yeah. This means that about. Two-thirds of students don't really think their professors care. That is not good. Now, I know there's a lot of people here who are not in education. And I know there's a lot of you here who work in other fields. This is also applicable in other fields. So I did some digging, and I found a research study by Cigna that was conducted in 2020. Mind you, 2020 was a weird year, wasn't it? But anywho, they found that 61% of American adults had felt lonely sometime during the past year. So that's two-thirds of American adults had felt lonely at some point in the last year. So we can do better, can't we? Can't we? Yes. There you go. We can do better. And we can, we can start to think about how we can employ these things on a more purposeful basis. Now, I'm no fool. I know that there's big structural things in the world that these things won't change. Racism, poverty, food insecurity, home insecurity. These little big things might not be the big solvers of those things. I'm not a fool. I'm not trying to say that. But I think if we start doing these little big things, Perhaps we can create spaces and positivity where people doing that work can continue to do that work. Little moments of joy and happiness. And that also people who are living in those situations have that little boost, albeit temporary. So these things matter. Now, I bet there's some of you now who are thinking, ugh, I didn't know I was signing up for this touchy-feely stuff today. Oh, no. And I am a scientist, I'm a social scientist, I'm a sociologist. So we are going to dig into the science of this now. We want to know, like, why does this work? How does this work? So we're going to start by thinking about your brains. You all got one, or well, at least I hope you do. So your brains. Now, I'm not going to tell you anything that you don't already know. You already know that when you do something nice for someone, you feel it, yeah? You feel it. I don't know where you feel it. I kind of feel it here, but maybe you feel it here. Maybe you feel it here, but you feel it, yeah? You give someone a gift, and you feel good about that. You don't need no science to tell you that, do you? But I'm going to tell you science that tells you that anyway. So when you do something nice for someone, when you do one of these little big things, your body produces what we call the happy hormones, serotonin and dopamine. And that fires off in your brain. And that makes you feel good, yeah? And you know that. I don't have to tell you this. You already know that. The second bit of this is that scientists have found that those people who do these little big things, those people who you know, help people, actually have amazing health outcomes. Because when you do that, you get a little less stress. You get a little less anxious. You get a little less pressed. Your blood pressure goes down. Your resting heart rate goes down. You sleep better. And what they found is that those people who perform the little big things over their whole life actually live longer. Amazing, huh? So at this point, you know two things. You know, one, that it feels good to do something like that. And two, now you know it's going to make you live longer. So then, why aren't we doing more of this? Because it feels good and it's going to make you healthy. Why aren't you doing more of this? So this is where we're going to go with our next study. Our next study asked that. Why aren't we doing more? So this study uh, was conducted by Dr. Amit Kumar. He's a marketing so a psychologist out of the University of Texas at Austin. And what he did, he went to an ice rink in Chicago. And, ready for this, we're going to do a recreation here. He 
got hot chocolates. Now, he gave these hot chocolates randomly to 70 people at the ice rink. Dave Thomas, let's recreate this experiment. Let's make sure I'm not sure here. So, what they did, they said, okay, you can take that hot chocolate and you can give that to anyone you want. Go. On. <laughs> Who's thirsty? <laughs> anyone you want. You know what? Debonair. Ah, yeah, Devonair. Okay. So, this is what the experiment did. They went back to the giver and they said, on a scale of one to ten, what, zero being not so happy, ten being very happy, how did that make you feel to give that gift, to give that hot chocolate? Ten. A ten. Now, this is where it gets interesting. They asked the giver, how happy did you think it made the person who received it? How happy? Go on, just give it a go. Twelve. Twelve. <laughs> Dave Thomas has confidence, and I like it. I'm there for that. But here's the rub. When they interviewed the people who received the hot chocolate, most people weren't like Dave, the givers. They said, well, I think maybe they were like a four, or five, or a six. But when they asked the receiver, how happy did that make you? What's the scale again? Sorry. One to ten. Ten. Ten, yeah. Everybody knows I love chocolate, though. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. And that's yours to keep. So I want to say thank you for Saxby's for uh, providing that hot chocolate there. Uh, um, yeah, but let's think about this a bit more. We tend to underestimate how happy we make other people. And that is systemic. We all do that. All the 70 people that were asked to give chocolate to someone else did said, oh, maybe, maybe they were like a four, a five, a six. But most of the people who received it said, oh, that was great. That's an eight, nine, or ten. So that's our first clue that we are bad at judging our impact, our positive impact on other people. Now, the second thing is when we contextualize that finding into other findings about how our brains work. When you decide to do something nice to someone, your brain is doing a few things. It's trying to work out what's going on and giving you a dialogue. So it might be thinking, well, what if, what if Deb is lactose intolerant? Oh, and I, I, I upset her. What if, uh, what if she's vegan? Oh, God, you hate me. What if, what if she just thinks it's really weird? It's just like, it's a, it's a hot chocolate. Oh, my God, what if she thinks it? I've poisoned it. And our brains does this, <laughs> and I haven't poisoned it. Our brains do the weirdest thing. Our brains try and talk us out of doing these good things. So the two things together, one, that we underestimate how happy we make other people, and two, that our brains are going, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, maybe that's why we don't do it. So this brings me to my second surprise. I'm going to come back on here. My second surprise is that thanks to the lovely people at Saxby's who provided that hot chocolate, they're invested in this. So under 10 seats in this room, taped to the bottom of the chair, are papers that are going to give you a prize. So have a look under your chair. We did do this, yeah? <laughs> Has anyone got Yeah, Hey, Josie won one. Wave it if you got one. Because people who've got it, you're on the hook now. Because Saxby's are going to give you, one, a very nice reusable cup, but inside the cup is some credit to buy your own hot chocolate. <laughs> and then you have to go and pay it forward. Repeat this experiment and do it yourselves. And then you're going to report back to me. I'm going to get your names, and I know where you live. <laughs> so, OK, so we now know that why our brains may be fighting against doing these little big things. So it occurs to me that we've got to do something a little bit more rigorous to get ourselves through this, to actually start doing it. So this is where some research comes in about professors. So this research study conducted by Corel, um, what they did, they found some random professors from different schools, different majors, and they said, 
What we'd like you to do is divide your students into two groups. One group gets nothing. The other group is going to get three emails. Those emails are going to be addressed personally to their name. It's going to contain a line or two about how they're doing in the class, and you're going to sign off using your name. A personal email from a professor to a student. Now, I bet you can guess what happens, yeah? The students that received the emails, three tiny emails in the semester, those students went on to get better grades, make it through to the end of a semester at a greater rate than those that didn't receive it, and amazingly, if you track them over time, persisted to graduation more. Three little emails. Three little emails, that's all it took. Now, what's even more impressive with the findings is that they found that students from historically underrepresented groups had the biggest gains. Immigrants, first-generation students, and students of color particularly responded well to those three little emails. You can write three little emails. And if you're not a teacher, if you're not a professor, you can write three little emails to someone else, can't you? And this is easy. This isn't hard. And we see that it helps people get through things. It has literally made a difference. Now, thinking of more studies, I want you to think back to any situation you're in, and you're new, and you're finding your way around. Think about that person that you know that says hello to you. When you're new somewhere, and they go, hi, and they might learn your name. Hi, Faye, how's it going? That means a lot, doesn't it? And to be honest, I still like that, and I've been here years. And I still like saying hi to people, and people saying hi to me, and that they know my name. But here's the thing with education. It only takes one person, one, just one person on campus for a student to have a connection with, and that student has greater persistence rates than those people who don't. Because you know this, yeah? It doesn't take science to tell you why. You already know this, because it matters. It matters. So it doesn't just have to be a faculty. Think of all the people in the room. I'm so delighted you've all come today, because you represent so many different people. Faculty, there's facilities here, housekeeping here, advisors and counselors, even the president. We've got everyone here, but you are all capable of this, aren't you? You can say hi to someone. You can, you can say, hey, how are you doing? Is that really so hard? You might be the person that keeps a student on campus, that keeps someone in a job, that gives them a little boost. We can do it. OK, so to wrap up this section, I can't talk about happiness without mentioning this amazing man. This is the late, great Edina. Edina was a, soci uh, sorry, a psychologist, and he dedicated his whole life, 30 years' worth of work, to happiness. He studied every facet of happiness. He studied how happiness uh, affects income, and there's a relationship there, how happiness affects marital status and happiness in marriage. He studied uh, happiness and health, which we saw earlier. But the thing that he did that really stuck with me that I think is interesting is that he challenged this idea about who does these nice things, yeah? And Dina said that most of us think that happy people do nice things, do these little big things, yeah? And we tend to think that that's it. If the person's bubbly and happily, happy, they're going to do these things. And Ed Dina said, no, we've got it the wrong way around. If you do these little big things, these kind things, these compassionate things, it makes you happy. It's the other way around. That we're so hit up thinking that only happy people can do these things, that we've missed the truth in front of us, that doing these things make you happy. So should we do an experiment? Oh, you all look so scared. <laughs> Don't worry. OK, so what you're going to do in this experiment, you're going to get out your phone, you're going to come off Nearpod, and you are going to go to a text message. I want you to text message something nice to anyone you want right now. You could text someone that you love them, 
You could text someone that they are appreciated, that you're thinking of them. Come on, let's all do this right now. I'm giving you permission to text in my class. This is, this is rare. Now, I am going to text my mum and tell her that I love her. I love you, mum. Okay. I have completed, completed my text message. Okay. Everyone sent a text message? Any stick in the muds that didn't do it? Boo. <laughs> okay, so for the people that did it, hands up if you feel slightly better now. Okay. All right, I would say that was about two-thirds of the room just said they slightly better. So let me see. There's 100 people on Nearpods. I think there's 200 people watching online, and there is, I think it's 250 people in the room. So let me do some quick some mathematics there. My brain isn't working. Let's just say 400 people. There's 400 people who just sent a text, and you all feel better now. So we just made 400 people's lives a little bit better by doing that. But if we factor in the people that we've texted, that's now 800 people. We just made 800 lives better. Just like that, in about 10 seconds, yeah? Think about this. Perhaps Tuesday lunchtime should be text a nice message. That everyone could do this at Tuesday lunchtime, yeah? Anyone you want in your address book, except the, the people who are stalking you and go crazy. <laughs> Not those people. <laughs> Anyone you want in your, your contacts list, send a message at Tuesday lunchtime. I appreciate you. Thank you. I love you. You're great. That stuff makes a difference. Now, real quick, did anyone get any responses yet from their text message? OK, how are the responses? Good. I see lots of thumbs up. There you go. We just made a difference, everyone. So in terms of this, Think about it. We all just did that. Now, you might describe yourself as happy or sad. You might decide yourself as a good person, a bad person, or you might be a giant jerk. Especially if you didn't. But the good news is, is that anyone can do this, yeah? Anyone can do a little big thing. You can be the world's giant gaping apple, as someone told me to say. A gaping apple. You can be that person, but it doesn't preclude you from doing something good right now, does it? It doesn't matter what your track record is. It doesn't matter, because at any given moment, you can do some good. You can send that text message. So with that in mind, let's start thinking now about how this might look. So we've had a, we've had a, a little trip with our text message, text message on Tuesday. We can do that. But I thought we would look at some people who do this really well. And they are people who kind of demonstrate what we all ought to be aiming for. Now, this brings me to my third surprise. Two people in this room have no idea I'm about to do this. Da, da, da. So my first case study is a person that I know that most of you know. And it's Derek Perkins. Stay right, don't turn around. Okay. Yeah, right. Stay there. Just look at me. Okay. Okay. Just look at me. Okay. I want anyone in the room who has been positively impacted by Derek to stand up, please. Thank you. But you have to stay standing. <laughs> so, Derek, uh, let me. Okay? Okay, yes. Okay, Derek, I'm going to tell you why I think that you are a master of the little big things. Okay, you ready? You're going to cry. So, what you do that is so special is that you see people and you hear them. Our students in this room come from every single walk of life. And you meet them where they are, where they are. You address them, 
and you feel when we talk to you, it feels like you're the only person in the whole world when we talk. Now, sitting next to you is Miss Dee Dee, who's one of your students in one of your programs. And she told me this. She said she knows how busy you are, and you are busy, but you never have too little time to give her a hug and to encourage her. And you do that for literally hundreds of people. Oh, hundreds of people. So I would like everyone to thank the most amazing man. You're amazing. You're the person I want to be. So I'm going to let Derek do his thing here. And then I'm going to come to my second person. So my second person might not be as well known as Derek, but this person is important. And it's really easy to overlook the people that perhaps aren't front and center. So this person is Regina King. Stand up, Regina. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about Regina and why she is a little big thing practitioner. So Regina's on our housekeeping staff. And the first time I met Regina, it was like I'd known her all my life. How are you doing? How's it going? So good to see you. You are positivity just oozing out every pore. Every pore. And you bring something special to this campus. And it's not just me. I watch you, and that's not creepy watching you. <laughs> I watch you, and I watch you interact with our students. And we've learned that just one person makes a difference, yeah? Regina is that one person, I think, for lots and lots of people. You make a difference. Thank you. You are very kind, and you are so loving, and never lose that positivity. Okay, let's give Regina a round of applause. <laughs> okay, so they are our two case studies of, of behavior that we might want to model and behavior that we might want to emulate. But over the course of this year, I've interviewed about 100 people about their favorite teacher and about these things, just chatting with them. Haha, I've been doing research. You didn't know it. <laughs> and after hearing all of these stories, I kind of came up with a list of things that I thought were qualities and things that make up these little big things. So in terms of what these are, I call them guiding principles. You could call them a framework. You can call them whatever you want, a playbook. But these are the things that matter. So the first thing is really obvious. You've got to give. That's the hard thing, yeah? You have to give a little bit up to get something back or to make a difference. Now, a lot of people, when they think about giving, you think about money, don't you? But we don't all have money. We don't have that privilege, not all of us. But the good news is, is that there's way more things to give than money. And some of those things are even more important than money. So you could think about your time. Think about your time. Now, for me, when I had no money, I had a lot of time. And now I have money, I have no time. <laughs> but time is, time is both free and priceless at the same time, isn't it? So your time is worth something. Think about what you could do with your time. You could read something that someone's written, can't you? Hey, can you read my draft? Hey, could you read this email, make sure it's not weird? I do that all the time. So you can give your time. You can really think about that. You can think about, OK, what happens when someone needs, is in just a bit down? You can give your time by sitting down and talking to them, can't you? You can do that. You can give your time by volunteering and helping out other people in that way. So time is one thing that we can give. We can also give resources. So it's not just money. Do you know who I think keeps Philadelphia running? I think it's grandmas. <laughs> I do. 
Because it doesn't matter what time you turn up at grandma's house, it doesn't matter if it's not your grandma, they will try and feed you. They will try and feed you whether you want to be fed or not. But think about that in terms of resources, yeah? Philadelphia is a city where about a quarter of people are in poverty. That means a quarter of people don't have enough to eat. Think about what you could give with food. Easy, yeah? Think about the other resources we have. Maybe you have school supplies and books and things like that that you could share. Maybe you could also do things like share your networks and connections. They're resources too. So they're things you could do. Other things you could give. I think everyone is good at one thing, at least one thing, yeah? It might be that you are really good at studying, a really great historian. It might be that you make a really good mac and cheese, in which case, please announce yourself so I can come and have some. <laughs> you are good at something. You know something. Maybe you know the route to something. Maybe if someone's struggling and they need a grant, you might be the person that knows how to fill in the form or where the form is. That's a form of giving, isn't it? So giving doesn't have to be money. It could be that knowledge too. Giving, if you have it, could be power. How do you bring people along with you? Now, everyone has a little bit of power. Some people have more power than others. Structural stuff, we know that. But you have a little bit of power somewhere, don't you? You can make a seat at the table to someone. You can help amplify a voice. Maybe you're in a meeting and someone's not being heard. And you say, hey, I think we should listen to this person. That is, a, that is a little big thing. For that person in that situation, being pulled along like that is a big thing, especially if people are not seen and heard. Then the last thing you can give, and to me, this is the one that means the most, but it's the hardest, and that's your energy. Because we're all going through stuff, aren't we? But I look around the room, and I know so many of you, and I also know what you've been through. We're all dealing with stuff. So sometimes when other people are dealing with stuff, it's hard to dig deep, isn't it? You feel worn out because you've got your own stuff you're carrying. But if you can dig a bit deeper and just listen, I think that really makes a difference. And I can absolutely say in my life that those people who have given me that emotional energy, again, has led to me standing here today. You have all helped me. And there's so many of you in the audience that have helped me. You know who you are. So thank you. So that's our first guiding principle, to give. Our second guiding principle is to uplift. So this is the fun one. This is the one I like. This is when you encourage people. Yeah, you got this. Do you know this morning, I must have got about 50 text messages saying, you got this, Faye, you can do it. And let me tell you, every single one of those text messages meant something to me. And I thought, I honestly thought I was going to poop my pants. <laughs> but I'm all right. Thanks to your text messages, yeah? Thanks to that. Thanks to that encouragement. And I know that that means a lot to everyone to hear, you've got this. Never underestimate the power of a, you got this. So think about encouragement. Think about support. So a lot of people think about support in terms of when you're down, yeah? That's what we go to. Oh, that person just lost a loved one. That's when we support. Hmm. I think support is the rough with the smooth. Right now, I'm feeling, I'm feeling amazing because so many of you are celebrating this with me. Support also means championing people and celebrating their victories, yeah? Being really happy that your friend just had this thing happen to them. Really happy that they met a new person. Really happy that you got an A on your test. Support goes both ways. So think about how you can be that person, how you can be that champion, that person always saying, yeah, you did it. So we've got give, we've got uplift, and the last one, and this is something that Derek does so well, it's validate. So when we think of validation, let's go back to that stat that I told you at the start of the talk. 
61% of adults feel lonely. That's because we're not being validated, yeah? What validation is, is that you, you are worthy. You belong. You're important. And sometimes it only matters that you're important to one person, yeah? And that's enough. But for those people who feel continually unimportant, continually lonely, we know how that can look, can't we? We know how sometimes that ends up. So validation is so key to the little big things. So the first thing you can do to validate someone, you can acknowledge them. That's real easy, yeah? You can do it privately on a text message on Tuesday lunchtime, which I know you're all going to do because you're all good students. You could do it publicly. Everybody loves a little public praise, yeah? Because it feels good. You know it feels good. And we can do that. We could do that in our friend groups and say, hey, did you hear this person did this amazing thing? And then your whole friends are like, yay. Or it could be, if you're working, it could be in your little group at work. It could be in a public space where you publicly acknowledge people. So acknowledgement is important. Now, the next one is the lowest hanging fruit on the little big things tree. This one's the easiest one. Compliment people. It's easy. If you're, I think if you're a woman, this is really easy, yeah? Because we kind of learn that that's how you make connections with people. I love your earrings. Those shoes are awesome. But that's one way to do it, and that's totally valid. But the best compliments, the very best ones, are things about people's character, isn't it? Like you're loyal. You're really loyal. You're a real hard worker. That kind of thing. So compliments are easy and they're free. You don't have to have anything to give a compliment. The next one is hard. It's to listen, although you're doing very well today listening to me. But to really truly listen to someone is hard, isn't it? So I want you to think about how it goes. And I'm very guilty of this, so I'm going to fess it up right now. Now, when I listen, sometimes I'm listening for the break, for when someone stops talking, so then I can say my bit. And I'm kind of getting used to the pattern. And then sometimes I do this, and I apologize for anyone I've ever done this with. Some of the ways that I listen and make connections is that they tell me an experience they've had, and I equate it with an experience that I've had because it's me connecting to that pain or to that feeling. But as soon as you start doing that, you've stopped listening, haven't you? Because you've made it not about the person who's telling you. So this is a personal growth thing for me. Maybe you could join me as well as becoming better listeners, because listening validates people. Listening makes people feel important, doesn't it? And we know with 61% of American adults feeling lonely that we can do better. Our next validation, easy peasy, say thank you. I don't get to say anything more than that. Just say thank you. Thank you goes an awful long way to validating someone's effort, yeah? You've seen them, you've heard them. Now, the last one is quite hard. It's respect. That's part of validation as well. Perhaps someone comes to you and says, hey, I'm going through this thing. I'm embarrassed by it. But you show them the respect, you show them the time, that means a lot as well. So these are my three guiding principles, to give, to uplift, and to validate. So you know what you have to do, one of those three. So this brings me to my, what number am I on, fourth, fourth surprise? So we've got something that's going to make you do this. You didn't think you'd get out of here alive, did you? <laughs> You're going to get some homework. This is the only time I'm going to get to assign homework to like 400 people at once. So remember when you came in and you had a card on your chair? Find that. So everyone in person has got a card. Find your card. This is a grand experiment, by the way. The first thing is that if you are watching online, if you're watching either live or later, you are going to default to yellow. Now, these cards, first of all, are a reminder. I want you to hang on to this card. I want you to put it on your fridge or put it in your office, put it on your office door. Let's put this somewhere and remind ourselves to do these things, yeah? Visual reminder.
But the much better thing is that these cards are going to code for something. And depending on whether you've got yellow, blue, or pink, you've got a different experiment to do. So you ready for this? Are you ready? There you go. All right, so we'll start with the pinks. Who got a pink card? Wave it up if you've got a pink card. OK, all the sociologists got the pink card. I swear it's not a fix. OK, Jeremy over there, Lindsay over there. OK, so if you've got a pink card, I'm going to give you $20 to pay it forward. You can do whatever you want with that $20 as long as you do good with it. So the opportunity might present itself to you now, or it might present itself to you later. But you are going to give that 20 bucks to someone who needs it when they need it. And you'll know, yeah? You'll know when to do that. And when you give it to that person, you want to say this is a little big thing. When you're back on your feet and you have 20 bucks, pay it forward. And let's see how it goes. So there's probably about 10 people in the room with a pink. If you want to claim your 20 bucks afterwards, you'll go over to the table over there and we'll sort you out. OK, so pink people, that's what you're doing. Where are my blue people at? Who got a blue circle? Let's wave them up nice and high. OK, all right. I see you. So if you've got a blue circle, you are going to receive this book. It's called The Keanu Reeves Guide to Kindness. I like Keanu Reeves. <laughs> But I also like Keanu Reeves for other reasons, mainly because he's a decent human being. And he's, he's renowned for doing these little big things. And his whole book is all the little big things that he's done. It's quite a lot, huh? So if you've got a blue, you're going to go and see Sandra afterwards and pick up your, your book. And you're going to read it. You're going to employ it. And then you're going to sign your name at the front, just as I've signed your copy. And you're going to give it to someone else. And you're going to give them the same memo. Pay it forward. OK. Now, if you've got yellow, which most of you did and all of you watching online did, where's my yellows at? You're a big crowd. There you go. I'm sorry I couldn't afford to give away more 20 bucks, but <laughs> I've got bills to pay. So if you've got yellow, this is your assignment. Sometime this week, I want you to do a little big thing. That's it. You can do that. You can send a text message. You can do any of the things we're talking about. Now, I know this feels overwhelming because basically there are a myriad of things you can do. It might present itself organically. Maybe you'll be walking along and someone will be struggling with something and you can help them. Or maybe it could be more purposeful. These things can be pre-planned. They're just as valuable. But I figured we'd come together and come up with some ideas about what you might do. So what I want you to do is pull out your phones again and go back to Nearpod, and we're going to collectively come up with some ideas about a little big thing that someone can do. So if you would please like to type back in there, and let's see if some of the suggestions as they come up. Okay, I'm sure they'll be coming in just a second. Hug a friend. Make a gift bag. Tell a professor something nice. Give someone flowers. Buy someone food. Tell them that they're doing great. Buy someone food at the store, give a stranger a compliment, send a coffee, phone a friend to check in, bring candy to class, encourage someone, treat someone to coffee, call my sister, that one's very specific, Vance. Um, <laughs> help someone with something that they may not know or help them in the future, cancel class on this gorgeous day, psych, I don't teach today, uh, send a handwritten note of thanks to a co walker. Bring tea to someone in bed. That one is an excellent one, and that's from my English friend, so that one especially hits home. Uh, randomly send a gift. Uh, give mental health day to students. Give a high five. Make someone laugh. Check in on someone who haven't spoken to for a while. Pay for lunch. Give someone some love. Give a random hug. Acknowledge effort. Call a friend. Donate to the snack rack. Yeah, donate to the snack rack. That's an excellent program here at the Community College of Philadelphia. Uh, uh, fix someone's phone for free, tell them that they're proud, uh, say I appreciate you and I see you. And the list goes on. You passed, yeah? You passed. You just all suggested something that shows me that you understand these little big things. Now, what I'm going to do, because I'm extra and you know that I'm extra, 
uh, I built a website. It's the first website I ever built. And this is some help from Angela Miles here. So this isn't going to end now. Oh, you think this is done? You think you're going to go and eat food and live your life? Oh, no. Your homework is to report back on this website. So the name of the website is littlebigthingsproject.com. It's on your card there. On this site, you will see the guiding principles. You'll see a toolkit, including a playlist, which we're going to play afterwards when we have a party. Uh, we are going to take action, so there's some suggestions. I'm going to put all your suggestions into this list of things we can do. We've got your stories here, including, if we quick go in there, we have all the people that were featured today. There they are. Uh, we have some other things as well. We have a blog and, and whatnot. And then we have an Instagram page. If you want to join the love on Instagram and get inspired, we have an Instagram page. So you are not done, yeah? This is not over. You are now challenged to do this. Now, I bet there's still a few people in the room that are like, this was a waste of my hour. <laughs> Talk about telling me the obvious. This doesn't really matter. Why does any of this matter? It doesn't change anything. And I'm sure there's a few of you in here who are feeling that right now. But I dispute that. I dispute that from the bottom of my heart. And I'll tell you why, and I've got to keep it together for this. So about five years ago, I received the following student evaluation. And this student evaluation makes me cry every time I see it, so I'm going to give you a warning. This is what this student wrote. <sighs> now, here's the rub. Now, we're trying to keep it together. This always upsets me. I don't know what student wrote this. I have not a clue what student wrote this. No student came to me over the semester. No student came to me and said, I'm having trouble. No student said to me, I'm feeling down. Not one. We didn't have anything in our class about mental health. We didn't, we didn't do any of that. So I can only conclude that it was a little big thing. It was one of the things you wrote on the board earlier. It was the littlest of things. And because of the littlest of things, there's someone who's still alive. So don't underestimate the power that you have to make a difference. Please don't. <laughs> so, to conclude, I invite you to continue on this journey. I invite you to really try and put this in action. And I invite you to join me on doing the little big things. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>